All right, thank you everybody for being here. Good afternoon. Welcome to um, this panel of the 15 years of research of the Cambio Center. My name is Veronica Perez Picasso. I'm the Cambio Center coordinator, and I'm happy to introduce our panelists today um, who are uh, uh, Corinne Valdivia uh, and um, Lisa Flores, who are our current interim co directors, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Janetta, who, we, who is our our former Cambio Center um, director. And um, the three of them will talk uh, about some of the research that, that, um, that the Cambio Center has conducted in the, the last 15 years. So I'm going to uh, open up um, to allow um, um, Dr. Flores to share her screen. And, um, and so we can, you, you can begin. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. I can folks see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, and if everybody can have um, put their um, microphones on mute, um, that way we can, it won't, the, the recording won't be distorted, please. Okay, okay. I think, Corinne, uh, whenever you want to get started. Okay, I'm ready to get started. This is new for me because Lisa has control of the slides. But welcome everybody. Uh, we're really happy that you're here to celebrate with us uh, Hispanic Heritage Month and the 15 years of research of Cambio Center. Um, and um, you, can, you can go to the next slide, Lisa. And so uh, today uh, we wanna give you just a little feel for Cambio uh, and Cambio Center uh, and our mission and um, what we are about. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we wanted to start by acknowledging our director, former directors now, Domingo Martinez, who was the first director of Cambio, and Steve, who's moving on to Minnesota. But we know that he will continue to be part of our network of uh, collaborators forever, for, <laughs> forever, hopefully. Um, and so, what I wanted to, to tell you, because Domingo used to do this, and I'm really bad at this, uh, he normally starts with a story. And um, I wanted to start with the story of how this happened, why we're here today. And, um, and it happened actually many years back when in 2000, the census data came out and we found out that there were so many Latinos all over the state and we were not uh, prepared for that. We didn't think about things like that. So we started trying to come together to think what can we do to make sure that the university, which has this role of making sure that all the knowledge that's being developed helps the well-being of the state and the well-being of communities in Missouri could come about. Uh, so, one of, the, one of the first things that we did, and Lisa, can you go to the next slide, um, is to, um, at the time, we already had the Hispanic and Latin American Faculty Association that started in 2000, actually. And uh, we decided that it was important to come together as a group um, of people that were really focused in trying to make things better in rural communities. And they happen to be from many, many, many places in campus. We, we had um, Kafner, the college where, where I sit, OSIDA, the Office of Socioeconomic Data Analysis. We had um, the School of uh, Law, Social Work, Journalism, Health, uh, and a lot of support from the Vice Provost Office for International and Minority Affairs at the time. Today we have support from the Office of the Provost in, in uh, uh, MU International Programs. But that, that, that um, impetus turned into a first com Cambio de Colores conference where basically we engaged it with communities and communities went, came, to came to the conference to talk about the issues that they were facing 
uh, the skills that they needed. And through that process, we started on the one hand organizing more conferences and we call Cambio de Colores our big community of practice about integration, adaptation, and well-being of rural communities, but not only in Missouri now, it's across the Midwest and in, in, in the US. Um, and then we, we decided that we needed to do research, really um, start developing the knowledge through the research in our communities to be able to then develop best practices. And that's how we started the process of applying for competitive grants and expanding the network of collaborators. So here today we have people from other campuses. We also have people from other universities <laughs> participating in the conf in, in this in this um, workshop not workshop seminar because we're all part of this uh, network or community of collaboration. Next please. And um, in a way, this sort of tells you a little bit of, of our vision and process. Um, from the first Cambio de Colores conference, which is the proceedings that you see in the bottom, to the last Cambio de Colores conference, which are the proceedings that you see in the top right, uh, we've been every year organizing this conference where we uh, bring all the lessons learned to share and learn from each other not only within Missouri, but across the across uh, the states in the Midwest, and originally from many places in the coast as well, because those were the areas that originally had more experience with newcomers that were settling in their communities. Uh, and this growth that we see has continued, uh, and therefore Cambio Center was established in 2004, uh, and through that process, we uh, were able to get some uh, funding through strategic initiatives to start the research and was the seed grant that allowed us to develop a lot of successful NIFA, National Institute for Food and Agriculture grants and other grants that we're going to talk about that were the seed of the research that was going on at Cambio in collaboration with Alianzas, in collaboration, especially with Extension at the university but through uh, many of the colleges. And also I need to acknowledge the College of Education um, as well as CAFNR that continues to support our work and um, the uh, Truman School for Public Policy. Next, please. Lisa. Uh, who we are. So through the years, and this doesn't capture, I don't think, all of the fellows that have come and gone through Cambio Center, but this gives you an idea of who we are. We are faculty that are really interested in uh, working to make sure that communities uh, and the youth in communities are part of that community that needs to grow and be what we call the wealth creation of, of our, our um, state and not only the state, but the country as well. And so you, you can see here, there are people from social work, there are people from extension, there are people from arts and sciences, from community development, from all walks of life that came together and continue to work together to come uh, and develop new knowledge and practices that uh, can facilitate integration. And I see Ana Romero from the School of Journalism as one of the pioneers that helped us thinking about this process as well. Um, next, please. And as we have collaborated through the years in research, along with it, we've worked with students, graduate and undergraduate students, graduate students that have become fellows of Cambio Center. This is a picture of the current fellows of Cambio Center. But as we were looking to the past, we've had so many uh, graduate students that are today faculty members at other universities, not only here in the States, but all over the world. Because interestingly, when we were working in Cambio, we had students from Latin America, from Africa, uh, from Asia, from Europe, uh, that were also working with us in the research that we were conducting. Next, please. One of the big um, roles that Cambio Center plays is, as I mentioned, Cambio de Colores. 
because that's the opportunity to translate the research and knowledge that we're developing into information that can lead to practice. And it's also the space where we can develop the, the networks of collaboration because normally what we found in a context of change is that you need really very diverse networks of collaboration that include the receiving community, newcomers, and many institutions and organizations that have a vested interest in terms of making sure that, for example, the youth are integrated to the communities, that students, that the youth then can come to university and um, also develop their skills so that they can then go back to um, their communities and other parts of the country to make a difference in terms of facilitating integration. And so we, through that process, have not only done production, uh, production of uh, briefs and podcasts and papers and so on, but we continue to try to communicate this um, constantly. Next, please. And this is just to show you that this is what the Midwest looked like. And you can see Missouri there with two little dots. And uh, next, please. And then uh, in 2010, Missouri, full of dots and darker dots because of the percent of change in the population of Latinos, not only in Missouri, as you can see, but across all the Midwest. So this is an important issue because of the fact that we want to make sure that every member in society is not only contributing to society, but is able to fulfill also their well-being. Next, please. And this is just to show and highlight again that the growth of the population of Latinos is very high today. Uh, so it's a key issue that will translate in a continuous growth that means that we need to keep on working and growing Cambio in the research that we're doing as well as the service that we provide to make sure that we grow in an inclusive community. Next. I think here is where Steve starts. It would help if I unmuted my uh, microphone. <laughs> so uh, when you look at, you saw that last pop slide where the, the, the dramatic increase in the number of, of Latinos uh, across the country, uh, it really played out in Missouri as well, where you can see virtually every county in Missouri uh, saw an increase in the population of Latinos. And, uh, it's really the only demographic group we've ever had uh, that had a presence in every county of the of the state. So over time, it could it will likely have a really important cultural, economic, and social impact on our places. Uh, next, and so when you look at um, why is this important? Well, look at our um, the university, uh, our community here is a university, for example. The changing youth population. This isn't just Hispanic, but in this slide, you can see how over the last um, uh, 30, 40 years, the white non-Hispanic population, young people, 17 and other, has been in a pretty steady decline. Uh, and uh, the Latino community has been in a really steady and, and in some cases rapid increase. And we're also seeing other minority groups, particularly Asians, that are also growing at a really rapid rate, and the African-American community as well. And um, this uh, past year, sometime during the last year, we went from being uh, more than 50% non-Hispanic white, um, 17 and under, to less than 50%. Um, that's who we work with a lot in, in university settings. That's who our students are. They're, they come from these many different places. So institutionally, we have to think a little bit more about how do we how do we adjust as a, as, as a place of um, study and as a um, uh, a place where our young people grow and develop into um, uh, professionals, um, how do we create an institutional environment that looks more like, like they do? Um, next. This goes back to Corinne or Lisa. Uh, next. Mm -hmm. So we're, we'll, we'll start sharing a little bit of the research that Cambio does and a little bit of the approaches that we've used. 
So in this, uh, what this diagram is uh, showing is the approach that we use. It's approach that uh, it's building first uh, through participatory research, focus groups, photo voice, case study research, uh, building up the concepts and notions that we then use to translate them into actual questions that we can also use in surveys. So we do the qualitative analysis and research, and it also feeds into what we're doing with uh, our survey, survey research. And what we are basically uh, then doing is turning those knowledge uh, that comes out of the qualitative into the uh, quantitative research, into information that goes into an appreciative inquiry process. So there is always this feedback process by which the knowledge that we're developing is then shared uh, with uh, the stakeholders to get feedback to see how we can really communicate what we're uh, learning next. One of the frameworks that has been very useful for us is focus, focusing on the strengths that people have, uh, thinking about their skills, their assets, their, their um, capabilities. And therefore, for us, that's um, what we call the strengths-based uh, framework of livelihoods capitals is uh, very useful to understand how uh, Latinos and families uh, and communities, entrepreneurs and communities can get by and can get ahead and get, can become part of the, the community. As well as understanding in which context this is taking place. So understanding what we call the context of reception or the welcoming mat is really uh, important in understanding how uh, individuals, families, and communities can negotiate these changes in, in order to improve their well-being. And normally we focus a lot on livelihood strategies um, and household strategies and family strategies in this process. Next, please. Lisa. Yeah, so um, we have used uh, Barry's acculturation framework um, to assess cultural capitals um, among the um, participants in our project. Um, so according to Barry's model, um, when two groups come in contact with one another, there is a transformation or a change, this process that occurs on, on the part of both groups um, with, um, with this connection between the groups. The acculturation has been assessed kind of multidimensionally um, to tap into the language use or language preferences, um, media uses, social networks, values, and kind of customs or practices that are engaged in um, by individuals. And to see what that connection is to the host culture or the um, mainstream Anglo US culture and their culture of origin, origin or the Latinx culture. According to Barry's theory, there are four different strategies that individuals use um, that includes a combination of their adaptation or connection to multiple cultures. Um, so an individual who is integrated um, is someone who's bicultural who is um, adapted to both cultures. So they can navigate both cultures uh, with relatively ease and fluency. Um, somebody who's assimilated has adapted to the host culture and along the way has shed um, their connection with their culture of origin. Um, and then the last one that I'll um, describe is separation, which is just the opposite of assimilation. It's somebody who has not adapted to the host culture um, not picked up any of the um, practices or skills within that culture, but has strongly retained um, those practices from their culture of origin. Within our project, um, the majority of individuals in our um, study were separated. Um, so about 75% of our um, Latinx immigrant um, samples from the Missouri communities that we were studying um, identified as having high connection to the Latinx culture and very low connection to their host culture. About 22% of those individuals were integrated um, or bicultural, 
and um, the other 3% were, were split between the assimilated and marginalized groups. One thing that is different from the work that we did is that the majority of studies that have um, examined acculturation um, among individuals really just look at that aspect from the immigrant group. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the model, Barry's model really uh, expects and hypothesizes that there are changes in both groups that occur. Um, our project assessed acculturation from both um, residents in the host community and the newcomers, uh, the newcomer immigrants in those communities. We also used Boris's framework where we um, looked at acculturation at the community level or group level, um, apart from the individual level. Um, and this framework gives us an understanding of how well the groups are working together, what their expectations are for integration or acculturation for themselves and for other groups within their community, um, to, to point out potential um, areas of tension between the groups, right? So um, consensual outcomes occur when there's agreement in the types of acculturation um, expectations um, of all groups within the community. And at the worst are the conflictual where there's no overlap um, and complete opposite expectations in, um, in how individuals and members of the community are going to um, acclimate or acculturate uh, into both cultures. So part of uh, one of the things that we were doing was, you know, and it's, this really ties back into some of the appreciative inquiry work is getting a sense of um, how are, uh, you know, what are the stories that people have? What are their perceptions of the place where they are and how do they communicate those perceptions? And so we did things like focus groups and um, photo books in our studies to kind of help both the communities explore some of the questions that we were interested in, but also that, that were interesting to them about their own experiences. And so we, we did this twice, uh, but once was really kind of getting a sense of what, um, uh, we, both times we did two questions. One was more positive oriented in terms of where are those places in the community you feel like, um, uh, you, you feel you can connect with people that are different from you. And uh, we would, we facilitated some dialogues around that with the groups and they, they use cameras to answer those questions. And then um, uh, we also then followed that with another round where they talked about, we asked them to take pictures of those places where they felt like they didn't belong, where they weren't, um, uh, uh, they weren't well received. And so um, we would use both panels to facilitate some of these discussions in communities, in these communities about what those experiences were like. Um, and it helped people get a, a sense of where they were starting from or where we were starting from, what was important to them. And you also start to see conflict um, in, in some of that too, in terms of perception. Some would see you know, a place like uh, a Walmart would show up both as a place they felt safe going and comfortable going, but for some others, they felt like maybe it wasn't such a safe place and it wasn't such a, uh, a welcoming community. And then um, when we were working with both the, the receiving community and the, um, the, the, the Latinx community, we, do, we, we did that with both groups and we could see how each group kind of compared in terms of their own perceptions of this, uh, of the place where they were learning. And it's, it's really those kinds of perceptions and exploring those similarities and differences that help people begin to move and think about uh, more curiously about what their experiences really mean for their own development. Um, the next. And so in the appreciative inquiry process, what we were doing was at the time, at, you know, the research model was really about engaging with the communities, getting a sense of what their stories were like we were doing with the, uh, with the, uh, um, the photo voice, but it's also engaging with them over time in terms of, well, how do we use this information to, to make change in our communities? And so uh, in, our, in, in our second study, we had a little money to work with each of the communities in terms of 
exploring what is it was that they could what that they were learning that they they really connected to and how they could use that to really begin to um to create uh change in their community and in one community they wanted to um uh, really kind of connect better connect uh, the uh, Latinx community to the resources in in that community because it was coming up over and over again that they weren't able to get basic things like uh, police support, um, uh, uh, city services, and some of those kinds of things. And so um, we started connecting with folks in those communities and they, they began to host um, uh, resource fairs. And in that first year, we had over 450 people come to that, that initial resource fair. And uh, out of that grew this whole uh, local community effort that's still going on now today, and it kind of moved itself into uh, the county of the Ozarks. Um, and in another community uh, up in, in Milan, they were mostly interested in, in youth development. <clears throat> and so we did some work with them around uh, engaging the youth around what it was that they wanted to see. And we spent uh, a day in a, a, a process there where they, they identified uh, three different things. One was creating like a welcoming mat. Uh, another was creating um, a, a group of, 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 of folks um, that would kind of work together to, to look at some of the things that they could do to more integrate the community. And um, gosh, I can't remember the third one. But literally all three of the projects were done within just a few months because the youth were the ones that were driving the process. And in the third community, uh, they had a uh, more resources in place. And so they were able to use that to focus more specifically on, on some of the things they wanted to accomplish in their schools. Um, and so this appreciative inquiry process was really about creating a strong connection between um, the needs of the communities they've identified themselves, things that they really wanted for themselves and using the information to help kind of drive a change process in the community that would help them address some kind of change at a basic level. Next. So what I'm going to share now is some of the research that we've been publishing through the years, just to give you a flavor for the things that we do. Uh, it's not all encompassing. Uh, there are so many um, uh, research projects that have been done through Cambio and with Cambio or in collaboration with Cambio. So these are some of the stories from the beginning of Cambio Center. Uh, and at the beginning, we didn't have data ourselves. So basically what we had to do was to use the PUMS data that came out of the uh, census data uh, and collaborate with OSIDA in this case to be able to, to, to work with that data. And one of the first persons that started doing research, a student, a graduate student and now is um, working for the World Bank in Africa, um, Pedro Dosi, uh, was working on his master's with me and he started this research and what we would, were wanting to do is to really understand the impact that um, driving while brown had as a proxy for context of reception on the earning ability capacity of Latinos and so next please so Oh, sorry, get back, get back. So through that research, what we found uh, was that actually um, the context of reception, driving while, while um, brown, had a negative impact on the generation of uh, earnings for uh, foreign born Latinos. Uh, and we also found that um, being able to uh, speak two languages well, was a factor that contributed to the earnings of Latinos uh, that were foreign born. With uh, Latinos that were born in, in the States, uh, their main uh, factor for increasing their income was traditional years of education as well as um, mobility. So when you move for work, you're moving because you're looking for a better employment. So mobility had a positive effect in, um, in Latinos that were born in the states that were living in Missouri in non-metro areas. So this, this 
data did not include the data from Kansas City nor St. Louis, but other parts of the state. Next, please. The next thing that we wanted to do, again, using the PUMS data, was to uh, add to that model by understanding the role of social capital and networks in the process of acculturation using proxy variables to understand or to measure that acculturation. So in terms of, um, we still included in, in this model um, uh, the uh, context of reception by using the attorney general's data on stops, um, the disparity index on stops while driving in Missouri. And we found again that that um, um, disparity index on stops by uh, driving while, while brown in Missouri had a negative impact on both Latinos born and not born in, 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 in the states. Uh, we also found that actually the mobility of Latinos was um, a negative impact on their earnings. So Latinos that were moving, that were foreign born, were moving because they were having to live that community and not necessarily because they had found a place where they could earn more for their work. And we also found that um, speaking English and Spanish being bilingual uh, had a positive effect on earnings. And one of the lessons learned from the work that we did was that it was important to encourage bilingualism if possible, so that um, the children wouldn't lose the language of their parents because in uh, later years, they actually had a good a positive in income effect. Next, please. As we were doing uh, this uh, type of work, we were also working on case studies and Anne Dannerbeck and um, myself were uh, actually going to rural communities and interviewing women that were working in three different areas of the, country and of the state. We were in Branson and Milan and in Sedalia. Uh, in these case studies, um, well, the story was also that we were going to try to go and look for work and we, uh, I was going to show, uh, ask for work and see if that I would get a good paying job and she would try the same thing with the same person and we were going to compare notes, but we didn't do it because we didn't have IRB for that type of research. Um, but um, what we did find when we were uh, looking at the work, what was coming out of the stories of women, is that they were, in terms of well-being, they were feeling better than where they were coming from. Obviously, many were coming from other parts of, the, of, the, of Latin America, but many were coming actually from the big cities in, in, the, in the U.S., and feeling that they were getting ahead because of the fact that they were living in a place that was less violent, they were living in a place where their children had an opportunity, and that was important to them, as well as having work. Um, what we found also was that they were not getting ahead, uh, just getting by when it came to making money, making a living. So those were some of the, the lessons, the first lessons that we were learning in terms of what was going on with Latinos and their families. And the reason we wanted to look at women is that in the data that we analyzed before that I showed you, consistently being women, being gender, being female, had a negative Im impact in income earnings. So it was important to understand what would be the traits and context in which women could actually get ahead while being Latino. Next. So we did, um, Corinne had mentioned some studies where we looked at income earnings um, and predictors of income earnings. Here we looked at job satisfaction as an outcome, which is a more subjective um, outcome um, that assesses individuals' happiness or satisfaction, how meaningful their job is. We found that with uh, the Latino immigrants in the three communities that we um, sampled that higher levels of ethnic identity, um, higher levels of Anglo acculturation, 
and lower levels of perceived um, discrimination experiences within the community were related to higher job satisfaction among the, the participants in our sample. Um, so this has implications um, primarily with employers within these communities um, who, um, who are employing immigrants. Um, one of the recommendations that we took back to the communities were providing opportunities for training um, in English language learning um, for their immigrant employees. Um, there are a lot of barriers um, for immigrants in the workplace um, or in settling within communities in the Midwest and language is one of the primary barriers that they experience. Um, so if there are opportunities to integrate language learning um, workshops or trainings within the workplace um, that can accommodate um, these workers, there's a likelihood, um, an increased likelihood that these individuals will um, maintain and, and stay, be retained within um, their jobs based on their satisfaction. I think one of the reasons that is important is because the data was showing again that the mobility of Latinos that are looking for work is basically a, a negative impact in, in their earnings. And therefore, a multiplier effect is negative when we're thinking about consumers and society. So it's important to figure out what are the, the uh, strategies that can be developed in order for people to have actual uh, greater satisfaction with work as a way of contributing also to the wealth uh, of community. I, I put here this, um, this uh, um, slide, uh, choices of the Ag and uh, Applied Economics Association, because it's, it's, a, it's the journal of uh, Ag and Applied Economics, and it's the journal that focuses on anything that has to do with ag, agriculture that's so important in every state. Um, and so normally the journal focuses on production, um, on market chain approaches. So very focused on, on the industry. But um, choices is the policy uh, dimension of that journal. And it was interesting that there was um, um, a move towards wealth creation and thinking about what were um, different dimensions of the capitals framework. The Flores, obviously, Neil uh, and Jan uh, have written a lot about community capitals and um, in developing countries and development, we use that approach of uh, looking at capitals and sustainability. Uh, but finally, it came back to the states and it came back to the mainstream profession of ag economics. And we had the opportunity to bring in the notion of ethnic identity and culture as important elements as we think about the wealth creation in rural communities in the country. So that was a, a key contribution, I think, that, that is ch changing the way we think about rural wealth and resilience. Next. Also, one of the things that, and we did two big surveys funded by NIFA, one in 2008 and one in 2012-13. Uh, obviously, in 2008, there was the terrible uh, economic crisis. And in 2013, we had really uh, significant problems with um, uh, the, immigration policy, the immigration policies and what was going on in communities. So uh, a lot of community people were really afraid of what was going on and wanted to be invisible during that time. But what we found uh, in, in our data is that uh, we didn't only have workers in our data, we had a lot of entrepreneurs. So we did an analysis of entrepreneurs and how they're using their acculturation process to develop networks of, for their businesses. And some are only Spanish separated types of businesses where they're connecting only to Spanish speaking people. 
And there were other um, that were more bicultural, that had been Anglo-acculturated so that do, they could straddle uh, serving to the Anglo community as well as to the Spanish speaking community. And in 2008, the, the important elements that we found that were that people were becoming very entrepreneurial because of the fact that they were losing their jobs because of the economic crisis. So you saw a lot of small entrepreneurs trying to develop businesses to get by. And in 2013, we see that the climate of community is one of the factors that is precluding people from uh, developing their businesses. So these are some of the lessons learned that we continue to study with regards to entrepreneurship. And currently we're working also on other NEFA project uh, funding with uh, working on minority and women businesses in, in the Midwest. Next. We've had um, two publications that have appeared in the Journal of Latinx Psychology. Um, one of them was a study that was led by Sarah May, uh, one of our um, student fellows in the Cambio Center. Um, she did this study for her thesis and um, conducted focus groups with both uh, host members of the host community um, or long-term residents within the community and also with the uh, Latinx newcomers and found that there were differing levels of capitals um, across the two groups and differing levels of uh, power as well um, across the two groups. And interestingly, after 15 years of um, change within that community, um, the, the interactions within the two, between the two groups were characterized as being largely unintegrated. So, this is a community in Missouri um, that had a, has experienced this change for many years. And after a decade and a half, we're still seeing very little interactions and connections between the long-term residents and the immigrant community. Um, another publication um, within JLP is a measure um, to assess community context. So when we first started doing this research um, almost 15 years ago, um, we found that there were no measures that were available to assess perceptions of the community context. Um, so as a team, we um, developed a measure um, and ran multiple analyses on it and arrived at a final measure, a 12 item measure that assesses individuals' perceptions of discrimination within the community, um, their perceptions of language pressures within the community, and their perceptions of the overall climate within the community. Um, so we have developed this tool and um, made it available for um, future research that we do here in Missouri um, and also available for researchers who are um, doing work with immigrants across the US. Um, and I know there's a team in the Northeast that is doing some work with Caribbean Americans um, that is um, currently utilizing the measure. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, some of the work we've done in in both the the health arena and in um, and in, in agriculture. So in in health, uh, uh, many years a number of years ago, we we were working with the um, Central Latino here in town, and uh, we were able to get some funding uh, to to implement a promotores de salud program, which is really about um, hiring, training, and, and um, using uh, health, uh, Latino, Latinx health workers in the community, connecting, uh, doing education programs, but also serving as connections to help people access healthcare. And one of the things that we saw coming out of that, we were able to fund it for twice, um, and ended up having funding for about four years to do this program. It was really successful, but we were really not able to get um, uh, ongoing uh, support for it, even though we could show it made a big difference in terms of the he healthcare access experiences for folks. But one of the things we came out of that with is needing a better understanding of what the healthcare access experience was like for uh, Latinos and other immigrants. Can you go to the next slide? And 
And, and so uh, I had an opportunity working with the Missouri Health Equity Collaborative, um, which was a project of the um, <clears throat> Center for Health Policy. Um, they, uh, we, they, we were able to get funding that included um, doing some work with immigrant groups, uh, not specifically Latinx, but it included Latinx groups to understand their um, experiences trying to access healthcare. So we did uh, six or seven different groups, uh, including Latino, Latinx in the Kansas City area and in rural Missouri. Uh, we did interviews with folks um, to get a sense of what it was like for them to access healthcare. And then we talked to providers around the state also to get a sense of what it was like for providers to, to access healthcare. And a lot like in the other projects Corinna talked about, we were using these things to kind of get a sense of what is it we really needed to ask a broader population about. And so we were also able to do a survey statewide of the, the Latinx community looking at what that experience looked like for them. And we used some of the measures that we've been developing, like the acculturation and climate numbers, to get a sense to see if those things had an impact on, um, on, on people's ability to access healthcare. But we were also able to use these, these interviews that we've been doing to, to get a sense of what that might look like. And in this particular case, um, when we were talking with the health providers, they would say things like, um, well, um, we, we, we prefer that, uh, that they're not supposed to use translation from family members, but it's up to them. They can do it if they'd like to. Uh, they like that better than, um, than, the, than the, the phone, uh, the interpreter phones. And um, almost all the health providers really hated the interpreter phones. Uh, and they kept saying, well, you know, the, the, the immigrants don't like that either. And then in our data, this actually the opposite is true. If you look here, the second most comfortable way instead of having a, a professional interpreter is, is having a phone interpreter. Uh, they're actually quite comfortable with that. But if you look at it, they don't get that opportunity very often. Um, and then you look at uh, family members, um, they're comfortable with children doing that, which we know they shouldn't be doing. But when we think of uh, other family members, they really, really are uncomfortable with that. And so, the, and even the children, um, you know, the, a third of them, almost a third of them are comfortable with that. And another 30% aren't really all that, don't really have an opinion about it. So the idea that um, we're able to take a look at some of these things in a variety of different formats and get a sense of how these things impact uh, how we're, we're doing business in terms of connecting people to these resources, I think was really important. In addition, we were able to use this data um, uh, to, to, to really look more closely at things like social capital, um, acculturation, climate, and uh, uh, we had a student do her dissertation work on some of that, looking at health insurance as a proxy for access to, to, um, to, to health care. And it turns out, you know, if you don't have health insurance, you don't have access, particularly if you're, if you're Latinx. Um, next slide. So the other thing we were looking at is in agriculture. And our most current project is a Latino agriculture entrepreneurship project, which is actually a multi-state project done uh, here in Missouri with um, Iowa, with um, uh, Neil and Jan Flora working with us there. And then in um, Michigan, we're working with the Julian Samoran Research Institute. And so a number of the, this kind of work comes out of a, a number of projects that we've been doing that kind of led us in this direction. Can you go to the next slide? So in, in Missouri, we started out with um, uh, uh, I had uh, some funding with, we did a collaborate funding with the, um, the uh, Center for Rural Affairs in, in Nebraska. It turned out in two, I think it was 2010, Nebraska and Missouri were showing uh, the inc really rapidly increasing numbers of Latinx population, but in the ag census, they're showing decreasing number of Latinx farmers. And so, uh, we got some funding to see if we could figure out why that was. Well, one was that they weren't really good at counting farmers. Uh, but the other part of it was that there were a lot of people going in and out of business quite a bit. And so uh, we were able to get another project, and this was more of an extension project, to kind of develop some educational programming that would help them on understand, uh, help them with basics of like farm management and, and, 
and, and some other things as they related to farming, but we still really didn't understand all that well some of the 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 issues that were really focused on on you know uh, the, understanding the field of farming in the United States for the Latinx farmer in relationship to the, the field of farming for the, the white Anglo farmer. Institutionally, all those, um, the field of farming is built around the needs of the white Anglo farmer. And how do you begin to understand what those needs are for the Latinx farmer and then begin to build bridges across that? And so we again did some in, uh, focus groups with uh, providers and, and we I, I covered a number of issues they were having in terms of communicating and um, uh, uh, really accessing the farmers, things like um, uh, uh, cultural differences, um, perceptions that the providers had about uh, Latinx farmers in terms of are they really farmers, and then uh, and then working with the Latinx farmers in terms of getting a sense of what it was like for them to try to access those resources, and then we've uh, also did a, a survey in the three in the three states so that we can get a better sense on terms of what these farmers look like, you know, and if you look at our, our little um, uh, diagram here, where we're trying to create a sense of what uh, farmer, uh, the Latinx farmer looks like and needs in terms of their, uh, their, their um, development as farmers in the field of farming. And so trying to get a sense of what, what does it look like for a farmer that's new to farming and accumulating the resources and assets they need to grow their farm? What does it look like when they're trying to move from being a farmer that um, has some resources but isn't able to make a living at it? And what does it mean to move from, well, I'm making some money at this, but uh, how do I do this full time? And so uh, we were looking at some of the characteristics and we're kind of analyzing that data at this point in terms of trying to figure out what those key elements are. And we've been working back again then with the, the providers and others to get a sense of how our research then can inform their, their practice in terms of working with, with these farmers. The next. So I'm um, thinking that we might stop here, Steve. Um, I think we've given kind of a good kind of breadth of the research that we have done and some of the products in the group so that we can have just a few minutes um, for Q and A from the team or from the um, uh, audience. I think there is um, there's a, there are a couple of questions here in the in the yeah, in the chat box. Um, Jorge asked, "Have you found an increase an increasing in gang enrollment due to the increase of immigration to the Midwest?" We haven't we haven't assessed for um, enrollment of uh, gang participation among youth in our projects. Uh, now, I would say in, in, in the rural communities that we've, we've worked in, that, that hasn't come up as an issue. Although if you sit down with some people, they will say that they, there are gangs there, but then when you actually look at um, uh, what's going on in those communities, it's, it, it probably isn't really what's happening. So. Uh, in terms of this, I, I, mean, I did a separate project where we were in one of the communities we actually ended up doing our Latinx research in, and it was about um, perceptions of uh, health. And they kept, several people kept saying, well, um, uh, that the, the, the Latino gangs were a real problem for health there. And so then I started visiting with some of the hospital administrators and I visited with the law enforcement as part of that same study. And they're saying, no, we don't have any gangs here. We don't have had any shootings here in that regard. And so what we had was this sense of this perception, mostly amongst the Anglo community, that there, there were these things going on in the Latinx community that, that just weren't showing up and weren't real. Uh, but there are, you know, I, I think maybe in other places there might be, but in some of these smaller communities, it, there doesn't seem to be. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Hi. First of all, I want to thank you for what, for a wonderful presentation. And um, I hope that we can have some real collaborative research projects together in the future. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was very interested in the healthcare uh, research that you did because um, 
uh, Clara and I had have done a little bit of work in the Latinx community of Kansas City, Kansas, which has a 50%, the Kansas City, Kansas public schools are 50% Latinx student population. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to go into this very dense growing population. And one of the places we talked, one of the leaders we talked to was basically a Latinx provider um, with a lot of sensitivity and staff who were Latinx. And I just wondered if, if all of the providers that you interviewed or accessed, whether they had people who, who were native Spanish speakers or were, were well versed in the culture or were they Anglos serving Latinxes who came in because that perception might be quite different. Mm -hmm. and, and regarding, for example, you highlighted the whole issue of uh, translate, you know, using uh, phone translation and the disconnect between what the providers were saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, so um, we, we, when we did the uh, provider interviews, um, we had a real range of, of experiences there. Yeah. It, we did some interviews in, in, in Kansas City, and we did some in St. Louis, and we did some in outstate, more rural areas. And in the Kansas City and St. Louis area, there actually had some really strong translation and uh, culturally appropriate um, uh, services. The problem they really ran into there was they didn't have enough of it. And, um, and, and because of the pressures of the job, they often didn't get to do things the way they wanted to. Um, and 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 then, uh, but we got into some of the more rural areas. There were a lot of disconnects between um, the the providers and the and the things. I mean, some of the things they were telling me were just kind of were really kind of scary uh, in terms of how they were thinking. Uh, even like in translation, uh, one doctor said uh, down in the southeast part of the state said, "Well, um, my patients don't speak English, but they understand me." And I'm like, "Well." Wow. How is that possible? <laughs> you know? So he wasn't using translation at all. He was just sitting there and then people would shake their heads and he thinks they understand what he's talking about. So um, there, there is a lot of acculturation work that needs to be done, I think, in that field. Um, and then in, in a lot of those places, they might be used for translation, might be somebody like a secretary or a family member, even though they're not supposed to do that. Um, and other kinds of folks who do translation, it's really a band-aid operation in a lot of the, the more rural areas and in some of the urban areas too. Okay, thank you. We have a comment here, a couple of things. Uh, I, 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 want to, uh, I want to bring back a little bit of, of the origin story of the center if you want. And uh, uh, only to mention a point, there was a strong institutional support at the very beginning when we uh, pushed to create the center because we had already been somehow successful with the Cambio de Colores uh, conferences, thanks to Steve, uh, Corinne, and, uh, uh, and, and all our colleagues there. So we had already shown the relevance and the need to address an issue. So and I am I am in the line in this because the issue was the main thing that drove all our activities. It was not an academic uh, thing. It was a, an issue with the state, which was the growth of the Latino population. In other words, it was a land typical land grant response to a to a to a matter uh, that affected the state. In that sense, being an issue-oriented thing, uh, it came, it brought people from different disciplines from the university. And that's the second thing that I want to address, jumping a little bit out of the, of the land grant origin of this, to how this research operated, okay? Initially, we did have uh, the strategic initiatives funding provided by the president of the University of Missouri, at the, and at that time, it was Elson Floyd. And uh, I do remember talking with Elson Floyd the very, f his second day at office, I guess. And it was uh, very illuminating and very, very, very good to be able to explain to him what we were trying to do. Uh, then the research came 
and uh, it came from USDA, which is not a normal, if you want, source of uh, research support for so-called minority issues, because we were addressing a, a problem that was actually closely linked to the, to the agricultural sector of, of, of the state and the Midwest. And I also want to, uh, to put a little memory there of the beauty of, uh, of, of the first large research USDA funded program that we had. We met almost, a, we, we met at, this, at, at the Cambridge Center office almost once a week, the whole team. And, uh, and we came from very different disciplines. So you had uh, Lisa, you had Corinne, and uh, something that was, I believe, relatively unique in the social sciences was that all the disciplines actually contributed to the building of the data set. And then they analyze those, uh, those data using their tools that their high expertise and academic uh, capabilities provided. This is very important to, for, for me, that was a very enriching kind of environment that we had. We always shared that information. We always contributed from different angles to try to get the best data set and the best analysis. So it was always focused on what is the final objective, which is to understand the process of integration and change and to try to provide tools to make it better for everyone, the immigrant and the receiving community. And I guess that that's what uh, uh, the, the, this continues to, to be done with a very important research that, that, that you guys keep doing at, at, at the center. So I will shut up now and just wanted to address that issue that I guess it's just important. Thank you, Domingo, for providing that context um, for some of the early work and uh, the competitiveness of the external sources of funding that um, the group received for doing this work. So it is, um, it's just slightly past four o'clock um, and um, we don't want to keep folks um, much longer. Uh, we know we are probably between you and starting your weekend uh, relaxation and um, rejuvenation uh, from a busy week. Um, we hope that to have another 15 years and beyond of um, collaborations and products to support uh, the state of Missouri to support um, our faculty and staff and students who are committed and engaged um, in this work in the area, in, in this area and to support their professional development. Um, and we look forward to the involvement of um, new folks um, and collaborations with um, our colleagues at, on other campuses within the Mizzou system. I agree with uh, Lisa in, in, in that sense that we are looking forward to working with you and to remember that uh, thanks to all the grants that we have, we have data that is there for all of us to work together on and keep on getting the, the knowledge out because that knowledge is going to be instrumental in informing change. And yes, we're here and please always connect with us. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck, Steve. Thanks. Uh, one of the things they found interesting about me it was I work at the Cambio Center, and they're really interested in having some of that kind of work done up in that part of this country as well. So hopefully maybe we can build some bridges there. We promise to collaborate. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice weekend. And we promise yeah. to organize more of these seminars because we have so many faculty fellows and uh, student fellows that have a lot to share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.